Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, brought to you by City Current and powered by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now here's our host, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're in for a fun treat. We have someone who, uh, when you talk about not just a local perspective, a regional perspective, but a national perspective on being able to make a difference, um, we have someone with this, actually even international too. But we have Carol Coletta. She's a senior fellow with American Cities Practice at the Kresge Foundation. And in addition to leading the foundation's initiative, Reimagining the Civic Commons, she's also on loan as president and CEO of the Memphis River Parks Partnership. And we'll talk obviously all about what that means but Carol let's start out with just how are you doing today how am I doing I'm doing great it's like um, the easiest question of the whole thing it is I'm doing great because we've got so much so much good stuff going on on the riverfront we are busy well, we'll definitely talk about that, including a big announcement and a big uh, event on November 9th. But um, let's start out with the fun of this podcast is we get to do a deep dive just on your personal story, a lot of the lessons that you've learned throughout your career. So let's start with a little bit of your backstory. So talk about your childhood and uh, growing up and give us a little bit of your, your childhood, if you will. Oh, funny. Um, I grew up in Longview Heights, which is in the heart of South Memphis. Um, I grew up uh, near a railroad track, near a fire station, could walk to school. And, um, and I could take 13 Lauderdale bus to downtown Memphis, which I started doing at a very young age by myself. Um, and so I, I think it was there that I developed all of my urban sensibilities and my love for Memphis, my love for downtown that has never left. Give us maybe one family tradition or something that, you know, growing up that you really enjoyed. <laughs> oh, um... We lived in a really modest house in South Memphis, and uh, I I am the middle child. uh, uh, But my siblings are, we're all spread out. My brother's seven or eight years older than me, my sister's seven years younger than me. So it was like my mom had three different families. But my dad was, my mom and dad never missed anything. My brother was a football, baseball player. He was an athlete. I was a cheerleader. They just never missed anything. They were just fantastic parents. Both worked, but they they seemed to be everywhere all the time. And uh, I was talking to my sister the other day. My dad, uh, wrestling, you know, it's always been big in Memphis, right? It's a big Memphis tradition. And and we had a wrestler who lived close to our, our home. He lived in the apartments. We lived in a house, right, that you owned really funny to think about the distinctions then um and this guy would show up at the big star um grocery store in the neighborhood right around the corner from us to sign autographs right so we kind of knew who he was but my dad had this really funny tradition where he would wrestle with us and you know sometimes i think gosh, today could you even get away with it? People might say, oh, it's child abuse or whatever, but it was the funniest thing. Even now, Connie and I, my sister, we we laugh about wrestling with my my dad, uh, who could always best us. He he was an athlete too, so anyway, we had, we we learned to hold our own. (laughs) Was he big into wrestling? Like, was he, did he grow up? No, but my, no, no, but my grand, it's funny, I don't even recall him watching it on television, but my grandfather did, uh, my mother's father, for whom I am named. He was a conductor on the IC Railroad, and he thought it was real, like a lot of people, right? He thought it was all real, and he got very much into it, like emotionally. He was very invested in wrestling on TV. So anyway, it's just funny. <laughs> well, some could argue that with the work you're doing, that it's a lot of wrestling. It's, it's a lot. It probably right was really good training, actually. <laughs> Give me, um, you know, from your end, maybe uh, a bit of advice or something that your parents uh, gave you that you still carry with you today. Is there any advice or just a lesson learned there that you still carry with you outside of the wrestling, obviously? <laughs> you know, my, my parents were not into advice, but I'll tell you what they modeled for me, and that was civic engagement. My mom and dad worked, um, they worked for candidates. Uh, we had s- political signs in our yard. They worked the polls. My dad was a poll watcher. They were involved in the PTA. They were involved in the booster clubs. They did pancake breakfast. Um, and they showed up, and they showed up for community. And uh, I 
I hope that I have modeled the same for my daughter. That is so critical in our society. And I think we've really gotten away from that in uh, ways that are not healthy in any democracy or any community. And that's something they gave to me that I hope I have passed along. Nice. Talk about kind of your first steps, be it college or professionally in terms of what you're doing, but, but kind of start laying that foundation professionally for where this began. Oh, I, when I was in high school, I think it was in high school, I wrote the mayor at the time a letter and told him what he should do about Beale Street. And he actually wrote me back and he referred me to the Memphis Housing Authority director who, was, who owned Beale Street at the time. And um, man, I proceeded to talk to him. So I don't know where I got the chutzpah to do that, but I was convinced I knew what to do with Beale Street. I mean, do I you was, remember what you like. What was you? What you? Oh offered yeah, actually, it was not unlike what it became. But but you would not remember. But actually, what Beale Street would become was very much in contention at. Uh, at the moment, now it seems inevitable what it would have become, but there was a move to tear down all of the buildings, uh, make it into something that would have been more like Fridays or Overton Square of its day. And, um, you know, I think it was sort of the, the, the push and pull between authentic and sort of new and what was considered hip at the time. and. Uh, I'm glad uh, where we. I'm glad we ended up where we ended up. Um, so, so again, I, I I think I was, I think I was born. To I was about to say you started taking early steps. I mean, obviously with even just the bus. And yeah, the even the bus going downtown. Going downtown and then absolutely. High school to write that letter to your yeah. point to get the gumption to go ahead and just take that oh, yeah, step. Yeah. And in some cases, ignorance is bliss, where it's like you just don't know any better. You you have an idea, you want to <laughs> share it, and next thing you know, it's like well, that becomes kind of your career path in a way. Yeah. Talk about, because I mean, you've done some really neat things. I mean, you've been uh, recruited to start Art Place. I want to talk about that. Um, you've also been, you were leading the Mayor's Institute on City Design. You've had a radio show, Smart City. You've had a popular retail store, magazine. I mean, you've done a lot, even kind of leading into what you're doing right now. So give us some of the highlights in terms of um, a little bit of your professional past. And we'll start talking a lot about urbanism and diversity. And I think there's some really neat things that you're, heavily involved with that we definitely need to talk about on this podcast. Well, I've had a long career, and it only makes sense in the rearview mirror. I mean, I, I, I counsel a lot of younger people today really wringing their hands about, you know, what to do and how to make the right step and not the wrong step, and it's like, just make a step because, you know, you'll make it make sense over the long term. My first real job was in the sports information office at the University of Memphis, the year we went to uh, play UCLA in the finals, um, which was in St. Louis, which was, and we had a new football coach that year after many years of another coach. So it was kind of an exciting place to be. I, I was hired actually as a writing assistant, but the athletic director decided I was a woman, couldn't be a writing assistant. So I had to be the the secretary receptionist writing assistant. That was literally my title, hyphenated. Wow. Um, therefore, uh, nonetheless, I uh, had a great time there, but uh, pretty soon had to, uh, I left that spot and was uh, hired on uh, at Holiday Inns by a remarkable woman. Uh, she was the only female uh, senior uh, VP in the company, uh, who had been part of the original WHER, the all-female radio station that Sam Phillips started. She had this fabulous voice. She was really smart. And I'll never forget one of the first things she told me. Always begin your letters with you. Uh, this is when we still wrote letters instead of email. Um, because people want to hear their story, they don't really want to hear your story. And uh, you always makes pe people perk up when you use uh, their name or you. And uh, anyway, she was a fantastic boss. But from there, I volunteered to get involved in something called the Court Square Task Force, uh, which was working on animating downtown at the time. 
And I called, I was a, I, these people were all downtowners, they were financial people working on it, uh, you know, I considered them leaders. And why they said yes to me, I do not know to this day, but they were very much open to my participation. I got involved, came to the attention of City Hall, the city's CAO at the time, the chief administrative officer, and he hired me and I got a chance to work on the earliest downtown uh, revitalization initiatives. Right. So that was, you know, again, it would. It all makes sense when you look backwards. Well, and I think on your end, too, the fact that you're in each of those steps raising your hand, saying, I want to be a part of the solution and offering your time and your expertise, even at an early age. I mean, that's, to your point, one of the biggest things, trying to get college students and just um, young professionals, grade school students, everything in between, to realize if you want to make a difference, you really do. Just raise your hand and start getting involved, and people will start paying attention, and more opportunities will, will come of that. I'm curious, though, going back to U of M, did it strike you when you're talking about kind of changing your title that that was wrong at that point or was it like in other words did, did you feel at that point like wait a second you know I'm going down this path but ultimately things need to change in a bigger picture or is it one of those where it was just kind of an accepted thing I'm just curious on your end did that spark anything or not um well, it did because I did not have very good secretarial skills. <laughs> you know, this is this is like it was not quite so easy to change. You know, mistakes. And fortunately, though, my boss, my immediate boss, was a fabulous guy who typed much faster than I did, and never ever made me feel like I need to do needed to do anything but the writing assistant awesome. work. And so I was very fortunate in that my first, think about this, my first corporate boss was female. And the person under her who immediately supervised me was female. Both were very good at their jobs. And before that, I had had this boss that completely ignored what his boss had told him and treated me like a writing assistant. I've been really, really fortunate yeah, along that's the awesome. way. Yeah, yeah, especially to have those role models. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so, so let's, let's dive a little bit deeper. So you start getting involved, and especially when you, when you talk about kind of urbanism and reimagining downtowns and looking at um, ways that we can build capacity, but also to uh, density. I mean, talk about, you know, those sort of stepping in to reimagining cities, which is a big part of kind of what you're even doing today. Talk about those first learning lessons, especially as a young professional stepping into this world. Um, you know, I, I think that as I think back on it, the first things I was, uh, I was always operating at two levels. I was always operating tactically uh, and then I was selling what others had come up strategic with strategically, right? So, so, so I didn't in the beginning have a whole lot of influence on what was done. The, so the big strokes, the big deals, but I helped sell those. Uh, what I was shaping in particular was sort of life on the street, right? How at special events. Uh, walking tours, how do you take what you have and without a lot of money and make something happen? So I began to be responsible for the activation of the big deals, um, particularly on Main Street and particularly in our riverfront parks, oddly enough. Talk right. about coming full circle. <laughs> um, so I, I think that that, is, that was very helpful to me. And I traveled... You know, as I would travel, I would always see things. Um, I was a subscriber to New York Magazine. I was always looking for ideas that we could apply in Memphis. Of course, you have a much smaller market than you do in New York. Uh, things that work in another city don't necessarily work in Memphis, uh, and vice versa. So, you know, you always had to think, what am I learning here that can be applied? Um, but nonetheless, I think I was all. I always had a. a a broader vision for what might be possible here. One of the ways we tested that out originally was not only in the events we would produce, but also uh, a partner and I um, opened a retail store in downtown Memphis, and we were really alone <laughs> uh, in in that endeavor. But we operated it successfully for seven years. So I, I think we always sort of saw the retail operation really not as anything we 
aspire to make a lot of money, and we were both working in on running the uh, business improvement district uh, in downtown, and decided, you know, well, we're out here trying to sell people on coming to downtown. We'll open something. Right. So it was sort of a proof, proof of concept, and then it was always a platform again for events and testing new ideas. What? Because you obviously do a lot of speaking uh, in other cities and working with other cities, and and we'll talk about that with some of the foundation work that you've done. But what you know, especially from a speaking standpoint, when you're wa- working with other cities and working with other groups, what are some of the lessons that you've learned and that you try to share with them on how do you activate, how do you, especially with little money in many cases, how do you draw attention, redevelop, create things that people want to be a part of that ultimately draw back to not only just a downtown but to uh, to create civic uh, a civic renaissance, so to speak. Well. I- let me say this when I speak and I do a lot of speaking in half of the last 15 years but I always try to tell sponsors of events I, you know I am not the expert in your city you're the expert I'm going to tell you what I know and you'll have to figure out how it applies to this city now if I'm consulting that's a different thing but you know, if I'm not taking a deep dive in a city then what I want to do is tell them what I know I usually don't talk so much about tactics although we've we've developed you know, over the years, many good examples from uh, work I did at a previous foundation uh, and the work that's been done for the last two and a half years uh, to reimagine the civic commons. So I will cite those examples. People seem to need to need them. But my speaking style typically, or my speaking content, I guess I should say, is really more based on research that I feel very confident can be cited with great confidence that is like, okay, fundamentally, this is the way the world works, and then you've got to figure out how to layer on top of that. Right. And, I mean, I, I'll, at some level, I'll, I'll say two or three things. One is that uh, talent powers economies today. So if you cannot develop, attract, and retain talent as a city, uh, you are not going to have a robust economic development uh, performance. And so economic development always has to begin with people, with talent. And so you can develop talent, right, with education, but that's a very expensive job. And so that means if you cannot hold on to it, you don't have the place where talent wants to relocate or to live, to remain. If I'm well educated and I will not stay in my city, that is really, pro- it's doubly problematic because the city did the job, the expensive job of educating right. me, and now I won't stay and, and right. participate. Right. So so it all begins with talent. So some people, it, it, old school economic development was you go out, you know, like you're a buffalo hunter. You go out, you find the buffalo, you kill him, you drag him back, to, back home. That's not the way it works anymore. I mean, very few companies do big relocations. They do expansions, but uh, typically expansions, you're still you're not going to get the best of the company, right? You want to get the home, you know, the home office right, the if you can, right. when you can. And so that means, and if you think about it, AutoZone was homegrown, FedEx was homegrown. You know, you can go down the list. Um, so I, I think that. Um, and, and that still is not completely embraced as a theory of change for economic development. Um, but with that then comes in, you have to have obviously places where there are families. You talk about like Shelby Farms Park. You have to have the amenities that go along with that to keep them where they want to stay. So it's you know, public safety, obviously. It's um, you know, logistics in terms of the roads and the and ease of convenience and low commute times. But then it's also all of these access to sports and recreation and family connections and here obviously faith. I mean, all of those pieces play a very vital role in everything you're talking about. So to your point, it can't be kind of a, a one side view. It's got to be a holistic view on, okay, everything we're talking about when it comes to talent attraction, we have to deliver and nice, retention and retention, right. Um, a, a nice quality of life that permeates so people have choices and options for them and their families and ultimately to create friendships too. Right. Uh, and the more connections people make in a place, the more likely they are right, to stay. Right. That's why that's why mobility uh, t- 
tapers off as people get into their 30s, right? Uh, because they've made the more and more connections they make, the more likely they are to stay in a place. Uh, but but there's also so frequently I'll talk about that, and I've been talking about that for a long time. I've done a lot of research in that area, and 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 supported a lot of research uh, in that area. I also uh, though. Uh, have a contrarian view about gentrification, uh, which I think is a, uh, in, in terms of how you revitalize um, urban neighborhoods. We've had an explosion of neighborhoods in America that are uh, extremely poor, and many more than neighborhoods that have gone from, from poor to not poor uh, in the last uh, 20 years. And so we, we are focused, I think, a lot on the wrong things. Uh, we're focused about how to sort of keep development at bay in, in a lot of um, disinvested neighborhoods when we ought to be thinking just the opposite. I also don't think you can redevelop a neighborhood and get the economic engine going if your big investment is affordable housing in that neighborhood. That's not to say you don't want affordable housing. What you really want, what's better for all of us, and I would say better for democracy is when we, and better for community building, when we can have mixed income neighborhoods. If you look at Raj Chetty's uh, work over time, now at Stanford, uh, and just came out with another, uh, another new set of maps that are uh, wildly interesting to me, is that if a, if a poor child grows up in a poor neighborhood in Memphis uh, versus the same poor child in, in the same poor family growing up in a neighborhood that is not poor, right? The adult outcomes for that child are much better if they grow up in a neighborhood that is not poor. Right. The worst place to be a poor person is in a poor neighborhood. Exactly right. And so, so that's where the zip com, the zip com is uh, affecting the outcome of their life, absolutely, the trajectory of their life. And so here, zip, Memphis, obviously, zip code the popular is destiny, corridor is, yeah. a, is a, obviously a much greater indication that they could have success. Which is why we need to focus much more on how do you bring new economic life to disinvested neighborhoods, so that um, um, you know life outcomes are much better for children there that's and that's a very very heavy lift uh again we've not done much of that uh in not only in memphis but in america so so i think that um those are the kinds of things i talk about i talk a lot too about how do you get socioeconomic mixing in public places that's part of the that underpins yeah. uh the civic commons work and the importance of those of those uh, places that we all share together. That's why I think the riverfront is much more than the riverfront is important. Not just because it's a set of parks. That's great. I love parks. They're very important. But it's really about how do you use the riverfront to bring people together across socioeconomic uh, lines? How do you help? Uh, how does the riverfront create? value in surrounding neighborhoods how do you use it connect to connect north and south memphis and bring additional investment to those neighborhoods um I, you know to say nothing of the health environmental uh you know and uh um ed even educational opportunities that the riverfront can bring so so thinking about space in multiple dimensions, thinking about every we've done over the years in Memphis. I think one of the things that we we couple of things that are really concerning to me. One is we thought of everything as a one-off, right? So so one plus one needs to equal three, four, five. It equals two at best because everything is disconnected, right? And we think we kind of think in silver bullet terms. We, the beautiful thing about Memphis to me is in the last few years, we've really begun to focus more and value more the connections between assets right. and sort of building off those connections. And that's a beautiful thing. I think actually Memphis is way ahead in that. And that's the kind of thinking we need to do more and more of. So because it, things cannot be catalytic unless they're connected. So connection and catalytic, catalytic go together. Um, that in and of itself is a great quote that people need to share on social media. <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, and then, and then I, I, I think we've been very. We're either sometimes 
too self-referential, right? Oh, we're so different. Those people don't understand us. It's like, that's the worst attitude in the world. We need all the talent we can get in our city working on our city. We need to be open arms with talent. And, you know, we'll take it part-time, we'll take it full-time, we'll take it any way we can get it. And that, to me, needs to be a, a changed mindset. Further, though, sometimes we're also, we're so longing for what some other city has done, we need to think, but when did they do it? Did they do it 10 years ago? Did they do it 20 years ago? So what is possible today that wasn't possible 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And I, and that takes, and that means risk taking. Right. That means innovation. That means thinking. Well, Long term leadership too. Yeah, and it means just don't, don't reference what people, what other cities did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and now there may be 15 of those. I can't build competitive advantage if I'm the last of the party and I'm trying to do it the way they did. Amazon didn't become Amazon. FedEx didn't become FedEx because they tried to outdo the postal service. FedEx out, you know, became FedEx because they did something fundamentally different. They took a risk. And that's the way we need to, we need to let FedEx's thinking permeate our own. Yeah. I love it. Well, I want to bounce back and then I want to bounce forward. So bounce back to when you talk about mixed um, income neighborhoods and creating a catalyst within that to revive uh, you know, certain neighborhoods and areas, corridors too. Is there a way to incentivize? In other words, is there a tip, a best practice? Is there something that we can do? Because I mean, obviously you have an altruistic where I know there are certain individuals yeah. that say strategically, I'm going to move to this neighborhood because I want to invest and I want to make that commitment. But how at a larger scale can we do that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's not a perfect package, but I do think there's some guideposts. Um, one, you need to say which neighborhoods are near economically strong neighborhoods, right? So if you looked at, say, the core city inside the parkways or adjacent inside and adjacent to the parkways, you would see neighborhoods that are the strongest in Memphis and you would see neighborhoods that are weakest in Memphis, but there's no connection between the two. So how do you use the what is working to sort of pull sure. it just a little bit uh, farther? down the road, across the road, whatever, under the viaduct. And you can see across the railroad track. You can see across the railroad track, Cooper Young, under the viaduct, Midtown to South Memphis, right. uh, across Crump, Jump Crump, you know, from downtown to South Memphis. So you can see all of that, all of those connections that are possible. Look at Crosstown and look at the neighborhood north of South, uh, North Parkway. All of those are opportunities of places to start. And then you say, what's the asset that has that plays bigger than just the neighborhood, right? So I want to be, oh, Crosstown. I want to be near Memphis Rocks because my kid wants to, you know, climb. Or I want to be near the river. So so how do you for an anchor? That's right. So how do you take an anchor, an asset that plays bigger? Uh, I also think you can look at job centers in Memphis and say, how can we put people closer to job centers? Um, you know, if you take downtown medical district president's island airport just take those and you think well if i didn't know any better if i were a developer and all i knew were the job centers and i wanted to develop housing where would i develop i'd develop right in south memphis it's right in the center of all of their job centers why isn't there development there because i think we have you know we we think of that as a disinvested neighborhood, many people don't even know where it is. Um, but it seems right, right because of where it sits in the job centers. Then the other thing is, I, we, we know that vacancy of any kind, um, both of housing and land, uh, become, it harbors crime. And if you remove that vacancy, the crime actually doesn't go elsewhere. It actually, you remove the conditions for crime and you remove crime. And so if I live in a neighborhood that has one or two or three vacancies, but I, I mow my yard, I keep my house up, you know, but I'm affected by that vacancy. So I think we need to be a better, do a better job of not necessarily going to the neighborhoods 
we need to we need to stop that nip that in the bud when there's that vacancy and be prepared those are the incentives i'd be looking for yeah. how do i get the fund that either can fix up houses quickly you know the front porch is a little some right. senior owns it the roof's leaking let's get that let's get that fixed so the people who are doing what they ought to be doing right don't suffer in and have their property values compromised because once that starts you're just on a downward spiral so how do you get there quickly and without you know with kind of the least uh, uh, noise in the system and get that working quickly yeah that's tons of great advice so let's bounce forward now so talk about the memphis river parks partnership as we mentioned right now you're on loan as president and ceo we mentioned also november 9th is a big date but you know give us a little bit of uh, what's going on on that front and then talk about november 9th yeah uh the memphis river parks partnership is a 501c3 so it's a nonprofit organization that operates in public in a public private partnership with the city of memphis that owns the land so that means if you're a memphian you own this property uh, we all own it together um we uh, and we're working to transform, uh, use the power of the riverfront to transform Memphis. I mean, so we, we see it, as I say, as, a, as an asset unto itself, but I can't have a successful riverfront in an unsuccessful city. So I knew when we think about the riverfront, 250 acres uh, over five miles that, that we steward every day um, uh, for the citizens of Memphis, we have to think of it as a catalytic asset. It's got to do a lot more than just perform for people who manage to get to the riverfront. And a lot of people do, by the way, uh, every single day. So, uh, but, but, so that's where uh, we're coming from. And uh, right now our priorities are, uh, we are raising money to transform Tom Lee Park, uh, which is going to be a phenomenal park. Um, once, once it is redone, it's really the last missing piece of our riverfront uh, once we can do tom lee park and we can do it in pretty short order we believe our riverfront essentially will be done now uh, there that's because we have three critical pieces underway today one is we're we're with the help of the hyde family foundation we're building a bike ped trail a bike pedestrian trail from the wolf river greenway on the north end of mud island all the way down to Big River Crossing, and then and then in, by spring, an on-street connection all the way down to Martin Luther King Park in South Memphis, what some people think of uh, the, uh, formerly was called Riverside Park, uh, which is very exciting. So that will open November 9th. Also opening on November 9th is this beautiful river garden at uh, Mississippi River Park uh, on Riverside Drive between Jefferson and Court, just at the north end of the Cobblestones, just south of the Tennessee Welcome Center. Uh, and that is going to be a jewel box of a park, uh, and it opens the same day, November 9th. Um, so those two big pieces, plus six blocks of historic cobblestone landing that's now in very tattered condition, that where all the cobblestones will be removed, cleaned, all the utilities put underground, and the cobblestones reset beautifully to make our cobblestone landing, which is the which is the biggest intact landing in the in the country, um, uh, a, a an asset again. Once we get those three pieces done, um, Tom Lee will be the missing piece, and you you know everybody knows Tom Lee. They've used it for Memphis in May, and and uh, we get a lot of visitors every 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 day at Tom Lee. Uh, but it is a very unforgiving landscape. It's flat as a pancake. It it has very few trees, and and it was it was the result of the city uh, wisely. Um, thinking about the future, adding fill to work that the Corps of Engineers did when the bluff, they were worried about the stability of the bluff. So they, they shored up the, the uh, shoreline uh, and then put fill on top of it with the thought that then we will build a park. Well, we never built the park. We just simply accepted the fill. Gotcha. And so this is, you know, this is too decades three decades later um time flies it's time to build a park 
And you know, if you if you're coming in I-55 around Memphis and you come onto Riverside Drive and the first time you see the Mississippi River, it's the money shot of Memphis, right? It's the it's the shot that everybody goes, oh my gosh, oh, yeah. oh it's breathtaking. That's where we take all of our guests. That's right. And so when you focus on the river in the ba- in the you know long distance, you go, oh my gosh, it's the most beautiful river view in the world. But there's nothing, but then you focus on the foreground and you go, oh my gosh, where are the people? This is kind of a sleepy river town. I think psychologically, the landscape across the Mississippi, which of course is natural because of the floodplain and the rise and fall of the Mississippi River every year, it's it's so contemplative, it's so beautiful. I, and no other city has anything like that. So it is unique, but the foreground, the park, does not match the majesty of the river. And that is our, that's not only our opportunity, I believe it's our imperative, because whether we like it or not, people will determine, they will get a picture of Memphis, they will determine what we believe about our ambitions for our future based on what they see in that park. We laugh a lot, we say, gosh, you know, people, People can find jewels all over Memphis. Um, I remember taking Rip Rapson, who heads the Kresge Foundation, one night out east to a dinner. And so I deliberately took him down North Parkway, and then I took him uh, down, you know, around the park, and I took him down Broad, and, we, you know, and we're get, we got off at Perkins, and we were going through and he said, are we still in Memphis? You know, and I was like, yeah, we're still in Memphis. It's that beautiful. Um, but you have to work a little bit to find that. We can't hide the riverfront from people. They don't have to go look, we don't have to show it to them. They are going to find it. Thus, they're gonna make a decision about how, what we think about ourselves based right. on the riverfront. So, so I believe that the great thing is we have a clean riverfront and we own it. So this is not land we have to remediate, we don't have to go buy it, it's ours. And we own it together, that's great. Now we just need to do right by it and, uh, and, and fill in this last missing piece with something that is really beautiful, really functional, and uh, serves the city, the citizens of Memphis really well. Well, like you said, to be able to then activate it. What puts a smile on your face when you look at, um, obviously, what's being created, but, but aside from the aesthetic beauty, to your point before about using it as an opportunity to really engage everyone, the, the whole community, to be a galvanizing force. What puts a smile on your face to see kind of what's in place to do that? Uh, well, uh, the last two nights I was down there uh, after sunset, right, just happened to walk down and uh, walked over the green roof. Uh, and when I get at the top of the green, first of all, there are always families there and, uh, you know, their kids, their daughters, everybody. And, even, you know, on a warm fall night, uh, <laughs> looking after sunset, seeing people still playing basketball, you know, still seeing people uh, exercising in the park, uh, still like, you know, their dogs are running. I mean, simple, it seems like such simple things, but, but actually it's that kind of asset. It's the asset, the asset that has most, valuable, uh, most value in terms of livability and attracting and retaining people are not the are the things that people are going to use, make part of their daily lives. Not the things they go to once a year, twice a year, when visitors are in town. That's great, and we need those things. But what really adds value, the reason people want to live near something is because I'm going to use it regularly. It's right. a regular part of my life. It's why the relationships, right? Why people don't move, want to move away from right. relationships. That's part of who I am. It's part of my life. And so the riverfront is that today for a lot of people. Go out there at 6 a.m. every morning. People are running those stairs. They're running the green roof. They're running the park. Uh, they're exercising. There are lots of trainers out there. It's a big part. The uh, And and. But what we're doing today is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we can do, will be able to do once we redo that park. Nice. 
Well, I think it's it's to me it's a, it's immensely exciting to see where all this is headed. But to your point, it's the value for our city that uh, is, is absolutely huge. So as we wrap up, we do something called lightning round, which is just real short uh, questions and real short answers on your end. So just more fun opportunities to get to know you a little bit. But let's start with what's a recent book you've read? Oh, I can't. I want to say it's Dark Blood. It was the one about um, Theranos, uh, the woman who you know had everybody fooled about how you could draw blood. It was incredible. Very good. <laughs> and Palaces for the People, which was more about uh, civic commons work. There Both you great go. books. What's a recent uh, movie you've seen or watched? I did go see A Star is Born, my third one. I never saw the first one. but um, And I had to say Bradley Cooper actually can sing. Totally um, believable as a rock star. Nice. That's good to know. We haven't seen it yet, so that's good. All right. Um, stay up late. Wake up early. What's your What's your normal habit? Oh, unfortunately, I wake up early and stay up late. <laughs> but if I had to choose one, I'd choose wake up early. Gotcha. Where do you like to take out-of-town visitors in terms of restaurants? Here's your chance to promote Memphis. Where, where all should uh, they go? Okay. There's a few places. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to get into, you know, the best way to start a fight on a plane coming to Memphis is which which barbecue restaurant sure, do you sure. like best? I take people to the Rendezvous. Okay. Uh, but I also take them to Maciel's on Main Street. I love Maciel's. And so those are the two places I like to take them there you go what uh is a favorite vacation spot outside of memphis so where, where else do you like to go give us maybe one or two of your favorite places ha huh. um you know i like to go anywhere there's a city that uh is interesting and that i can learn from i really i'm not much for i don't like the beach and i lived in miami which is really funny um <laughs> I don't like the beach, and I'm really I'm, mountains are gorgeous, but um, just give you a big city, huh? Give me a big city, city girl. Give me a city that I can learn from. Lisbon is uh, pretty terrific. I mean, there are lots of cities that I love for different reasons. All right, what do you like to do to relax? Um, bike, walk. Uh, unfortunately, though, most of my walks now involve. Let me write an email to my staff <laughs> on uh, what we need to correct. Why is this happening? So the walking thing is not so working, working for me this, these days. <laughs> but let me pull those weeds. Uh, that's what I've been doing on the green roof. So, um, you know, that's a little bit challenging. Favorite quote or advice from uh, anyone that you hold in high regard? Uh, my Former boss and longtime friend and mentor, Ron Terry, once told me, Carol, if I got, he was the head of First Tennessee, and he said, Carol, if I got run over by a bus tomorrow, the second thing everyone would think is poor Ron, because the first thing they would be thinking about is, what about me? And I always thought, that's really, that's a really good thing to remember. We all wake up thinking about me and mine, and... Uh, so if you can't explain, you know, if you can't put whatever you're selling in terms that make it about me and mine, it's a really hard thing to sell. Well, and it goes back to, like you said before, it's, it's about you. It's not yeah. about me. It's about right. you. Um, what advice would you give? We have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to the show. What advice would you give to an entrepreneur, and especially for you owning a business? Um, what, what advice would you give them in terms of going out with their career, starting a business? Listen to advice from good people. Uh, I remember there was a piece of advice I got when I was starting a second business, third business actually, um, from someone I should have listened to and I was really hard-headed about, um, about it. And his advice was, I'll tell you what it was, he said, find a way to test your idea. It was a new idea. Find a way to test your idea as cheaply as possible because you're going to learn something from that that will affect what you do next. And that was a huge mistake. Uh, I wish I had listened to him. It was Peter Formanak who gave me that advice. And he probably will never remember that. We're not friends, but he did tell me that, and I should have listened. What do you hope, because obviously you're still you know, in the thick of it in terms of creating your legacy, but what do you hope that people say about you and the difference you've made, not just for Memphis, but for our nation overall? You know, I, I don't. 
I, I really, truly, I don't have any ambitions beyond Memphis. I, I think Memphis is the most interesting, thorniest soup you could work in, right? Um, and I believe, I believe, I have always believed, uh, you know, my ring here says, uh, uh, always believe. And uh, I, I, Penny Hardaway, I was there, Penny, before you were. <laughs> um, I noticed they're all wearing believe. But, but I, I believe in this city. I believe in what we can demonstrate to the rest of the nation. People count majority black cities out. And that's, you know, there, there are fundamental reasons for that. They start with race and racism. Um, and I don't believe that. I don't believe that in my bones. I've never believed it about our city. And I think what we have the opportunity to do in this uh, wonderfully predominantly black city is to prove everybody wrong that we can be not only a success, but we can be successful with a very different formula. And I believe we can lead the way to America changing its attitude about what black cities can do, how they succeed, how they can lead the nation. I believe that about our city. And um, that to me is like, like who wouldn't want to work in that soup? I mean, I, I, we need to have very, very big ambitions about what we can achieve. And, and what we can achieve, not by being something else, but by just like, you know, completely leaning in. But that's going to require that we stop thinking, looking at things as deficits and start saying, how do we, how do we, how is, how are these assets, you know, we have to think of our demography as an asset and lean into that and um, and just and like embrace it. That to me is our exciting opportunity that will make us unique in the nation, which is why my ambitions for Memphis, that's, that's all the national ambition I want to have is to make this a nationally, even internationally significant city by uh, being uh, an unexpected success. Well, that right there puts a smile on our face. See, I told you, everyone, you would love her. She's a change maker, absolutely awesome. Um, and, and I mean, this is just scratching the surface for all the different things that you've been able to experience. And so, this is one of those we'll probably invite you on some of the different media just to be able to continually uh, learn from you. But as we wrap up, go ahead and tell listeners where can they learn more, find out more, just send us a, to a website, yeah, social yeah. media. Where do we go? Uh, MemphisRiverParks.org. Uh, in our social media, uh, you can follow uh, Mem River Parks, M E M River Parks. And we're out there on uh you know facebook twitter uh, instagram uh, They're easy to find easy to find and uh we have lots of opportunities for people to engage not just as consumers to be entertained and we love it please come uh but but we also have tons of volunteer opportunities and a lot of people are getting their hands on this riverfront again i'll just remind us all it's ours you know, we steward it on behalf of the citizens, but it's ours together. We own it. So, so when you want to get your hands on it, you want to paint, you want to clean, you want to weed, you want to plant, um, we've got jobs to do. So we're, and we're happy to have, uh, people as our, you know, get involved as our partners. Well, Carol Coletta, I greatly appreciate all you do to power the good. You are a change maker. Thanks for all you do and for coming on the podcast. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Changemakers Podcast, produced by City Current and powered by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. To learn more about our guests and to share your stories of others leading by example, visit us online at citycurrent.com. Connect with us online using at citycurrent or follow the conversation using the hashtag Changemakers. Now, think big, start small, and act now. Be a changemaker. 